expedition. True stories of man's quest for the unknown through the steaming jungles, across the burning desert, to the depths of treacherous seas, and to the highest mountains of the world. Expedition, actual films of the great expeditions of our time, recorded as they happen. Your host is the famous deep sea diver, author, and explorer, Colonel John D. Craig. And here is Colonel Craig. I've spent so much of my own life exploring the bottom of the sea that tonight's expedition is particularly fascinating to me, and I know it will be to you. First of all, it takes us to an area seldom seen by anyone, the bottom of the Pacific, off the coast of Russia and China. And secondly, there we'll get to see an incredible variety of sea life, forms so strange they seem to belong to another planet. And finally, this expedition was made by a group of the foremost Russian underwater scientists and photographers. We'll get underway in just one moment. First, this brief message. I've seen a great many undersea pictures in my day, and also made quite a few myself. But I have to admit that tonight's Russian expedition film is really exceptional. Naturally, I was curious to see what other countries are doing in underwater exploration, what kind of equipment they use, and most of all, what kind of life there is in an area that's been unexplored by Americans. And their equipment is every bit as up to date as ours. Their photography is breathtaking, and among many other things, they've come back with some of the most spectacular close-ups of sea life that I've ever seen. The whole film left me on the edge of my seat, and so this is one sea story I want to tell myself. The expedition starts here in the far western Pacific, off the Asian continent. The research ship from the Russian Pacific Institute is standing by to lower its observation chamber so that Nina Yerushkina chief expedition photographer and her colleagues can film undersea life under the best possible conditions. This chamber is very much like those I've used myself in deep sea work. The lid is closed tightly, air is pumped in at atmospheric pressure, and the whole contraption can be lowered or raised just as fast as the winches can work. Within, the diver is safe from the dreaded bands. The only thing he has to worry about is getting claustrophobia. The letters, which look like CCCP, stand for USSR in Russian. Even at great depths, there's no pressure on the diver, and he can work in relative comfort. A fairyland awaits the explorer in the mysterious gloom of the underwater jungle. You can't help being spellbound by the incredible diversity of life, a magic world where plants look like animals and animals like plants. Take the sea squirts, rooted like bright red plants to the rocks, yet they're animals, feeding on tiny organisms by filtering the seawater that enters through the opening at the top. Our cameraman has spotted something. It's a big, mean-looking bass, very much like the calico bass of the California kelp beds. It's a law of nature that the big ones feed on the smaller ones. These fellows usually hunt alone and closely guard their favorite feeding ground against others of their species. A real fight develops if some unwelcome guest intrudes. fellows are small squid, peculiar creatures with tentacles growing from their heads. Some species reach a tremendous size, 50 feet or more. 
They're literally jet propelled, ejecting a stream of water which propels them backwards at fantastic speed. I've always been fascinated by the odd crustaceans known as the hermit crab. You find them all over the world, always living in somebody else's discarded house. This one has outgrown his old house and is moving to a larger one. It's quite unusual to see them actually do it. Until it has its soft abdomen safely inside the new shell, the hermit crab is very vulnerable. Some of these crabs are not at all particular. Anything will do for a home, even a sponge. Some are so well camouflaged, they're practically impossible to spot. A wise precaution in this world of eat or be eaten. Like our own oceans, the sea off Asia abounds in many kinds of crabs, most of them very tasty. Like ours, these Asian crabs have a strangely contradictory nature. They can be touchingly friendly with each other, or they can be pugnacious and bellicose. Sometimes it's difficult to tell which is which, but in this case, there's not much doubt. Crabs can swim or crawl, but you'd think these Japanese combs were forced by nature to lead a completely sedentary life. Not so. They, like the squid, have developed their own form of jet propulsion. Many of the creatures we've just seen live on tiny marine organisms, so small they're invisible to the naked eye. An important phase of the expedition is to study this microscopic world. The plankton net is lowered to collect typical specimens. When the net is raised, the water filters through. The catch remains behind in a container at the bottom of the net, and thousands upon thousands of tiny creatures and plants fit easily into one glass jar. This good-looking young lady from the Russian Pacific Institute is about to let us look into a microscopic world of astonishing beauty and diversity. And a more fascinating world I've never seen. Life in a single drop of water, the basis of all life. Tiny plants and animals, translucent like their environment. A tiny dweller of the ocean bed, known as a hydropolyp, spreading its tentacles to catch creatures even smaller than itself. A remarkable microscopic picture of a minute jellyfish, and inside it, an even smaller crayfish it has just swallowed. There was also a team of skin divers on this far-ranging expedition, which covered much of the far eastern Pacific coast from China north to the Kamchatka Peninsula. This is very interesting. Their camera is very similar to a French model I've used myself. These Russians are using oxygen rebreather units with masks covering the entire head. Weird looking, but effective. Here we're in warm waters. The ocean floor is covered with corals. Those strange, minute creatures which take lime from seawater and build a skeleton on the outside of their bodies. These are most unusual and beautiful close-ups of living corals. In time, these tiny coral polyps will build on each other and construct whole reefs, atolls, and even islands. Not flowers, but rapacious animals. These are sea anemones, closely related to the coral polyps. The slightest touch and the stinging tentacles paralyze a careless fish who quickly becomes a meal. 
This type of outfit has advantages and disadvantages. It's more difficult to see with divided goggles than with our single faceplate. But on the other hand, this Russian mask covers the whole head and can't be accidentally knocked off. A type of puffer fish. Another animal that looks like a vegetable is the needle skin creature known as the sea cucumber, or trepan. Some species off the coast of China reach three feet in length. The local people consider them a delicacy, and diving for trepangs is a thriving industry. The sea cucumber is only one of the family of needle skinned animals. Better known, but a lot less useful, is the starfish. Marine scientists are trying to control it because it destroys literally millions of dollars worth of edible shellfish every year. We've been moving steadily north into colder waters, the home of the large octopus and the jumbo-sized Kamchatka crab. These crabs are usually sluggish by nature, but to me, this one looks more dead than alive. Full grown, these fellows reach three feet across. We've had the deep sea observation chamber and the skin divers. Now here's something very close to my own heart, the good old hard hat diver. I notice they only patted him once on the helmet before he goes down. Our signal is twice, otherwise it all looks very familiar. The weights carry you down and suddenly you're in another world with the fish staring at you as though you were some kind of monster plunging into their domain. Apparently, he's landed in a spot rich with specimens since he's rapidly filling his collecting bag. The kind of catfish, his curiosity is greater than his caution. Now he's going to be part of the crew's dinner. The northern Pacific coast, both east and west, is full of octopuses. They come in all sizes, and this obviously is a big one. But really, none are as big as the stories told about them, and on the whole, they are quite harmless. An excellent close-up of how he breathes. He inhales, closes the valve, and blows the water out again through his tube, which is also used for jet propulsion. Some of these scenes must have been shot from the deep sea observation chamber, suspended not far away, with our lady photographer aboard. When she saw how big it was, she must have become alarmed, thinking that perhaps the diver was in danger. She signaled the captain, and he, in turn, alerted the skin divers, who were glad to have a little action. This headlong dive shows one useful aspect of their peculiar headdress. You could never dive like that with an ordinary faceplate, because it would be knocked off by the impact. The divers hold a quick conference in sign language. Frankly, I don't think the diver was in too much danger, but there's always a chance of an accident, especially if both octopus and diver are frightened and the octopus gets a good grip on the man or his air hose. In any case, this was a chance for the skin divers to show their skill with a spear gun and for our lady photographer to come home with an exciting sequence. It's not only the undersea world that we explore tonight. The expedition will soon move north through terrific storms to a tiny island that is the home of 100,000 fur seals. And we'll join them in just one moment. The 
expedition now heads north toward the tiny seal islands off Sakhalin. These are the northern whaling grounds, and after having had a look at some of the smallest creatures of the sea, we're now literally surrounded by the largest. Some of these fellows are over a hundred feet long. There are many ships in these northern waters hunting the big whales, even in bad weather. The seas run in every direction here. The wind blows one way, the current goes another, and almost always the sea is choppy and unpleasant. Now we've reached the coast of Sakhalin. In the distance, the snow-covered cones of extinct volcanoes rise to a height of over 13,000 feet. Then the lookout spots our goal, a tiny island surrounded by treacherous rocks. Even at a distance, there's an almost deafening noise, the combined racket of thousands of nervous seals mixing with the constant roar of the sea. Getting ashore is tricky, and sometimes wet and cold. There's obviously a hole in there, and I can't see why these fellows don't learn. On film, it looks like a Keystone comedy. But I bet these men didn't think it was funny at the time. That water is cold. Despite the racket made by the landing, the cameraman was lucky to sneak up unobserved on a very rare creature. A sea otter, or as the Russians call it, a Kamchatka beaver, playing happily in the surf. fur is among the finest and most expensive in the world. Here he looks like a little beatnik. In years past, these valuable creatures were so mercilessly hunted that they almost became extinct. Now they're protected by law. But our primary interest is the fur seals. Judging from the roar, an enormous colony lives just on the other side of the island. The landing is made here, against the wind, to avoid frightening the animals. Nina Yerushkina, whom we saw earlier in the deep sea observation chamber, is in the lead with her heavy camera. It was worth the climb to see this. What a fantastic scene. On a beach only 1,800 feet long, there are at least 800,000 fur seals. Something like Coney Island on the 4th of July. This is the animal that was hunted so ruthlessly in the last century that it almost disappeared from the face of the earth. It looks absolutely chaotic, but appearances are deceiving. Actually, the colony has its own strict laws, 
and woe to the individual that tries to break the rules. Fur seals are polygamous. They live in family groups called harems, with a single powerful male called a bull and many females called cows. The bull maintains strict order in the harem, intervening the moment he notices the slightest disturbance among the females. Some harems are small, with only a handful of cows. Others have as many as a hundred. Very rarely do you see such a picture of pure family bliss, mother, father, and little junior. Off to one side are the single males, the bachelors who haven't yet managed to start their own families. Afraid of losing their females, the married bulls won't let the bachelors approach the harems. Sometimes they even gang up on a bachelor to keep him out. But the more courageous try over and over to break through. That's when the real fighting begins. The bulls attack the intruder, biting and pursuing him until he is chased from the edge of the harem. tries to escape by breaking through other harems, hoping that some of the females will follow him. But that usually starts an incredible rumpus, with thousands of seals joining in, and many rushing for the water. This is what they love best, playing in the surf and catching fish. They're so clumsy on the beach and so graceful in the water. There's nothing that looks quite so contented as a seal scratching. Each cow has only one pup, which he can pick out from all the others but you'll see some cows actually watching over whole nurseries of babies. What has always amazed me is that baby seals actually have to be taught to swim. Baby monkeys, kittens, puppies, all kinds of warm-blooded, four-footed animals know instinctively how to swim. Yet seals, much better adapted for life in the water, have to get swimming lessons from their mothers. But they do learn quickly. By the time they're six weeks old, they're already fine swimmers. The breeding season is over at the end of July. By August, most of the bulls who fasted since their arrival in May get ready to leave for the open sea to feed again. By November, the females, too, leave with their babies. It's been a good season for the Russian research group in its constant probe of the mysteries of the sea, the Earth's last unknown frontier. As an undersea explorer, I can appreciate what went into the making of tonight's film. You just don't get shots like this on the first try, or with second-rate equipment, or with unskilled personnel. But however they did it, it certainly was a beautiful film. Next week, we explore another remote region of the world. It's an unusual film, one I'm sure you won't want to miss. Until then, this is John Craig saying thank you and good night.